Good morning, ladies. This morning we are um, continuing our study in the book of James. I'm going to go ahead and tell you where we're going to be so you can be looking that up in your Bible. And then um, I'll kind of talk about what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to be in James chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 13 and we're going all the way to chapter 5, verse 12. Now, you'll notice that that means that we're not going to finish James in this session. Um, we've extended this study by one week just because there was just so much in this these last couple of chapters that I felt like needed to be covered and that we were going to rush through too much if we tried to do it all in one session. So we will, um, I told you last week that this would be our last session, but in actuality, next week will be our last session. And we're just going to focus on chapter 4, verse 13 through chapter 5, verse 12 this week. Um, I read a quote this week in a book and it said about James, it said, I'm so thankful that there are only five chapters of James. Now, let me qualify what this person meant by that. James is a challenging book and we've been challenged to look, take a hard look at our lives, to look at the fruit in our lives, to see if it reflects Christ in us. And so uh, today is no exception to that. We're going we're gonna to be looking at some challenging things today, and I pray that we'll be willing as we go into it that we're, we come to it as a hearer for sure, but ready to do, ready to obey what God shows us in this section. Now, I'm going to remind you again that James is a letter, and it's written to Christians who have been scattered outside of Jerusalem. It's written by James, uh, the half-brother of Jesus, but it's full of imperatives or instructions that he is giving to these Christians who have been scattered. Um, we're going to look at two of those today. Now, what happens when people scatter? Well, it makes me think of Jay and I moved here about 13 years ago. We moved from Memphis to Monticello. And when we moved from Memphis, you know, we packed everything that we thought we would need and that we wanted to move and, and you do all of that. But the one thing that I didn't have when I first got here that I didn't realize would be so important was that I was going to need to have some Billy Blue. Actually, I didn't know what Billy Blue was until I arrived here. But it wasn't long uh, after we had moved here and we began to be a part of the community and to go to football games and basketball games that slowly but surely, my closet filled up with Billy Blue. Why? Because I'm taking on some of the habits and activities of the culture around me. And now that's a good one, you know, to be a part of our community. But James warns them about things that might be indicative of taking on uh, the values and habits of the culture that they are a part of that might not be consistent with their walk in Christ. And he warns them about those. And I think that those are warnings that we can take into our heart too. So let's begin to look at these. He's going to warn them about being distracted and he's going to give them some comfort in the fact uh, that they don't have to be discouraged. And so we're going to look at that. Let's look at, we'll, we'll begin by reading in chapter 4. I'm going to read verse 13 through 17. And he begins by telling them to guard their priorities. So let's look at that. Verse 13 begins, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. All right, now these verses, I think if, if I could say anything in the book of James that speaks to the situation that we are in right now. It would have to be these verses. In fact, in reading through James, the weeks before we started this study, when I got to this passage, it says, don't say tomorrow or today, we're gonna go here and we're gonna do this. Say, if the Lord wills, 
And I think that we are, we're living this lesson right now. Um, it wasn't too long ago that I had to go into my classroom. Uh, a lot of you know that I'm a third grade teacher. I went into my classroom to begin to prepare for this year, and the date on the board is March 13, 2020. Um, that's the last day we were in school. And honestly, ladies, the day that we left on March the 13th, we had no idea that it was our last day of school for the school year. And there's all kinds of feelings that go into that and even seeing that date still on the board. But what it's a picture of is that our plans can be made, but they can also fall apart in a second. We thought we knew, but we didn't. So uh, let's look at the, cult, at the context of the people that James is writing to. They're living in cult cultures where there were people who were becoming very wealthy off of business, off of trade. And so James warns them here over prioritizing their own pursuits over and their own agenda ahead of God's. And so I want you to see where he says that. Number one, they have a plan. And in verse 13, we see that. And it's a specific plan because he says, uh, come now you who say today or tomorrow. So they know, they know when they're going to do this. And they say, we'll go into such and such a town. They've decided where they're going to go. It says, and we'll spend a year there. They've decided how long they're going to stay there. And we're going to trade. They've decided what their task is. And we're going to make a profit. They've even planned out this is going to be the outcome. This is when we're going, where we're going, how long we're going, what we're going to do there. And this is going to be our outcome. They had it all figured out. But then in verse 14, he says, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Okay, I, I would like to sum up verse 14 and even into uh, verse 16 where it says you boast in your arrogance. What he says to them is you don't know what you don't know. That's how arrogant you are that you think that you can look out and make this plan and plan where you'll go, when you'll go, how you'll do it, what you'll do, and what the outcome will be. As if your plan was going to be something effective, as if that was overarching. He says, you've got it all figured out, but the truth is you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what's coming ahead. But not only does he correct them, but then he gives them an appropriate plan. He says in verse 15, he says, Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live or do this and do this or, or that. He doesn't get on to them for having a plan. He just gets, he's just getting on to them. He's correcting them for letting that supersede God's plan. And we'll see that in just a minute. But he, what he's doing in verse 15 is he says, acknowledge that God's plan supersedes your plan. And then he goes on to say, you boast, in your, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. He, he tells them, recognize pride for what it is. And ladies, that P word, pride, is one that gets us over and over again. But it's when we think that we know better than God or, or maybe we can plan something outside of God uh, and His will um, and it'll turn out well. Recognize pride for what it is. And then finally he says, and then follow the Lord's lead. Acknowledge that God's plan takes precedent. Recognize pride in your heart and then follow His lead. And he takes just a mi minute there to teach them about sin because that last verse seems disconnected from the passage, and yet we're going to see how it connects. It says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. That little word, so, there is a connector word to verse 16 where he said, You boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So, Whoever knows to do the right thing and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Now, ladies, we're familiar with sin. Those times when we disobey God, 
when we, when we know what God's commandments, what his principles and standards are, and we choose to disobey that, that's, that's a sin of commission, lying, stealing, uh, adultery, all these kinds of sins are sins that we commit. But what he's teaching them about right here are what we call sins of omission. That's when you know what to do and you simply just don't do it. You just omit. And it's disobedience just the same, but rather than doing something that you shouldn't, you don't do something that you should. Now, what does that have to do with this context? Well, he's already said, if you have a plan acknowledge that God ultimately is in charge. And then he closes it by saying, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. When you know what God's plan is and you know what your plan is and you choose to do your plan, he's reminding them that's sin. They chose their own plan over his. They weren't outwardly sinning, committing sins, but they were choosing not to do what God or he was warning them against choosing not to do what God had called them to do. So what is our takeaway from this? And we've kind of gone through and taken apart the words there. But I, I want you ladies to know that this week, these verses have had me meditating and reflecting and journaling. Because here's the deal, I'm a planner, and some of you that know me know that I love to make a list, I love to have a plan, I love to check it off, I love to work the plan, and there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes having a plan is being a good steward of the resources and the time that God has given you. But here's the deal, it, a list can become a point of sin when I decide that my when, where, what, how long, my task, and even my outcome, when I decide that what I have planned is more important than following the leading of the Lord in my life, when I have a plan and I know that there's something that the Lord wants me to do, and yet I set that aside to follow my own plan, that's when it, that plan becomes a sin. I've also been thinking about something why do we get frustrated? You know, there are times when we get so frustrated. Oftentimes, it's because our plan hasn't worked. And I wonder if frustration in our hearts could be less if we would say, you know, this is my plan. But if the Lord wills, this plan could all go away. If there's something else that the Lord wants me to do with this day, this week, with this month, I think our frustration sometimes is wrapped up in our need for control. Because we feel that in that control, that's where we're going to find peace. If I can control everything, everything will be peaceful. But the truth is, ladies, is that our peace is not found in a plan. It's not found in a planner. It's not found in a to-do list. Because those plans are not secure. If we've learned anything this year, we know that at the last minute, our calendar can be wiped clean. So we don't find security in our plans. Our peace, our security is found in a person. Now, I'm not telling you not to make a list. I have a list at home that I'm, and, one, and recording this lesson is one of the things that I will check off in just a little while. But understand, as, as one news commentator says, breaking news changes everything. Be willing to let the Lord step into your list, into your plan, and to change it and follow his leading when he does that. He says something in there in verse 14. He says, you're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Lady, we're t ladies, we're temporary. Our lives are short and we are only here for that amount of time. The only way that our to-do list is going to matter beyond us is if we are building God's kingdom and bringing Him glory. And we can't do that when we decide that our plan is more important than His. So He, he cautions them and He says, guard your priorities and make sure that your priority lines up with God's priority. Then he kind of turns. Now, 
we've already said that in today's lesson, he's saying, you know, don't look around at the culture that you're in. Don't be influenced by that. He's still kind of in that vein, and yet he's going to take a very different tact. I'm going to read verses um, 5 through 6. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but I think it's important that we lay this foundation for what's coming in uh, verses 7 through 12. So I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 of chapter 5. It says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Okay, now he references here. We see again, come now. He says, come now, you rich. But he's not just, he's not specifically addressing just anyone who's wealthy. He's probably referring to those wealthy people that he's talked, that he spoke about in chapter two, where he said, they're the ones that drag you into court and and oppress you. Um, This is not an indictment against people who have wealth, but it is an indictment against those who have put their security in their wealth and have used it to oppress others. Um, Now he does, he points out a few things to them. And let's, let's look at that. He says in verse one, he says, there are miseries that are coming upon you. Okay. That's, that's kind of a nod to the judgment that's coming. He says, you have laid up treasures in the last days. He reminds them their time is short. He talks about fraud and mistreatment of others. But this is what I want you to focus on. In verse, um, let's see, let's find it here. Verse 4, he says something. He says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Ladies, this name for God, Lord of hosts, is is a military term. It signifies that God is the captain of heaven's armies. So what he is doing here is saying, the cries of the people that you have oppressed have been heard by the general, and he is coming in judgment. Now, this is what's interesting in this passage. He's clearly talking to unbelievers here. You know, this whole uh, letter has been written to believers. We established that in the first week. And yet all of a sudden he says, come now you rich, weep and howl because there's miseries coming on you. And the mistreatment that you've given God himself, the Lord of hosts has heard of this. This is the thing that I think we need to understand about this. He is not so much addressing this to those who have oppressed because they're probably not reading the letter. But what he is doing is he is reminding God's people of God's vindication for them. Um, Just a way that we might look at it. I know that when my kids were little uh, and if they would fall, maybe they would fall and, and hit the side of a table or fall on the sidewalk outside and skin up their knee. You know, of course we would clean that wound and give hugs and all that. But one of the things that Jay and I would do from time to time is we would say, bad table, bad table that you hit my my child. Or we would say, bad sidewalk. Why did you do that to Brooks or JC? Now, why did we do that? Because we were actually talking to the sidewalk? No, because we wanted our child and our children to know, hey, we know that you've been hurt and this hurt you. Guys, it's a weird illustration, yet I hope that you can see the point. Even though they're not listening, the the wealthy and the rich that have oppressed others are not listening. God's people are listening. 
and they need this reminder that God is watching and God will act on their behalf. Now, given that background that he gives them, let's read on in verses 7 through 12. He says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Okay, so <clears throat> he has reminded them that God is going to act on their behalf, that those who have oppressed them will not uh, get away with that. It might seem that in the moment, but it's not the truth. It's not the reality. So he gives them some ways that they should respond to suffering. And he reminds them in verse 7, he says, be patient. And then he gives them a word picture. Now we've seen this all through James. James loves to give them things to compare and things that they can relate to, that they can use to apply to these principles. And he talks about a farmer. And he says, the farmer plants the seed and waits. Now, some of you, and I, I know uh, Barbie Johnson, if she were in class, she could probably speak so well to this. And some of the rest of you who are involved in farming could really speak to this better. But you know, farmers don't plant a seed at one hour and then come back an hour later and say, okay, is anything there? And beat the ground and say, there's nothing here, there's nothing here. No, they plant the seed and then they wait and they trust that that process is going to produce fruit. And we see in uh, verse 7, uh, it says, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Now, of course, he's given them a word picture of a farmer waiting that well-earned fruit to spring up from the ground. But in our lives, what he's talking about when he says that precious fruit, we take the seed of the word and it's, it's precious because it blooms in our life and we see God's plan fulfilled. Now, here's, here's a couple of lessons we can take away from the farmer. He doesn't plan it and then despair. I kind of alluded to that just a second ago. He waits and he trusts. We also know that a farmer's not inactive. He doesn't plant the seed and then never come back to it to, again. He's tending it. And that's, that's when our relationship with the Lord, our walk the Lord is being tended to. I was listening to a song this morning as I, was, as I was getting ready, and it said, God is in the waiting. And so just as a farmer waits for his seed to produce a precious fruit, God is in the waiting, and that, that season of waiting produces fruit in our lives. Then he also tells them, he says, after he gives them that word picture, he says, prepare your hearts. Because in verse 8, he says, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. He reminds them that God will finish his purpose. Uh, and he says, establish your hearts. And that word establish, it means to strengthen, to fortify, to prepare your hearts. How do we do that, ladies? Well, everything that we've been reading about the last few weeks. Soak in the Word. Spend time in prayer. Um, learn from other believers. Pour into other believers. Fill your mind with the truth that the Lord is sovereign and His plan will supersede all others. Gather those spiritual resources for the day of suffering. Fortify and prepare your mind. Be well soaked. And then he tells them something else. 
he says, don't turn on each other. In verse 9, he says, don't grumble against one another, brothers, that you may not be judged. So I think sometimes when we find ourselves in difficult situations, and these people specifically in times of trouble, that we're tempted to turn on each other and blame each other and, and get discontent with the people around us. I think this is a good word for us right now. Even our church going into a season of transition and uh, nothing being the norm. To remember, we need to prepare our hearts with the word, but we need to be very careful that we don't grumble against one another. And then he says, look to examples. And he gives them the example. Now, he's already given them the example of the farmer who waits for the harvest. But he gives them some others. And he says, he says in verse 11, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. I actually want to back up to verse 10 because first he, he talks about, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. So he says, Look at the prophets. They witnessed, they talked about what God was going to do even in the midst of suffering. And now I want to look at verse 11 and, verse jo- and, and look at Job. He says, you've heard of the steadfastness of Job. Many of you will know the story of Job and know that Job persevered in faithfulness even in the face of suffering. So he tells them, look to the examples And then I think an important, important thing here is to look at the whole picture because he says something there and he says it in verse um, 11. He says, you've heard of the steadfastness of Job and you've seen the purpose of the Lord. He says, you've seen the Old Testament and you've seen the prophets and you've seen Job who persevered and spoke the word of the Lord, but you're You're New Testament Christians. You've seen the purpose of the Lord fulfilled. You know the Lord is compassionate and merciful and that His plan is to redeem. You've seen both sides. He said, look at the whole picture. Look at the faithfulness of Job. Look at the faithfulness of the prophets with only part of the picture. You persevere on. Look at the whole picture. And then the last thing he tells them, again, a verse that, Um, it's kind of hard to see how it connects. And yet we're going to look at that. In verse 12, he reminds them, don't swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Now Jesus said something very similar to this in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. And we've talked about how there are so many comparisons in those two passages. But I want to give you some background to understand what he's saying. Um, In this culture... Um, when you were making a promise to someone, it was not uncommon to swear by something, to swear by heaven or by earth, um, to make your word your bond. But there were those who would use that and they would swear by something that was meaningless and thereby they would deceive the person that they were making the promise to. And I think maybe a modern day comparison to that would be when someone says, I promise I won't tell anybody. And as children, we would say, oh, I had my fingers crossed. And so what Jesus is saying here is he is saying your word should be um, trustworthy and that um, you shouldn't enter into these, "I, I swear by this, you shouldn't even have to make those qualifications. You should be known as people of integrity. And so kind of knowing the context of that helps us know what he is getting at. And so we see when he talks about persevering and suffering, he tells them, he tells them prepare your hearts and don't turn on each other. Look to your examples. See the whole picture and maintain your integrity. Guys, a watching world um, is looking to you. So James begins. So that's, that's kind of our lesson for today. And, and let's, let's look at what our takeaway from it should be. He begins both sections in, ver- in chapter 4, verse 13, and in chapter 5, verse 1, with the words, come now. It's almost like some, someone saying, listen to me, look at me. I want you to really listen because these two things 
were important. He says, be careful not to focus too much on the culture around you. He says, this is important um, to specifically to these Christians because they're living scattered. They're living in a culture that's not familiar to them. Paul says it this way. He says in Romans 12, 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This reminder to guard our priorities and to persevere even in difficult times is something we need to hear at this time in our lives. Even at this time, even when nothing seems familiar and nothing seems normal, let God renew your mind through His Spirit and His Word. And when He does that, when that process is happening inside our hearts, we will find that we are prioritizing God's kingdom and we are persevering in suffering. Let's pray. God, your glory, Lord, is what we are seeking. God, I pray that that would be reflected in the priorities that we make, uh, the choices that we make about our time, the plans that we put together. Lord, I pray that we would surrender all of it to you um, to acknowledge who you are in our lives. God, I pray for ladies today who may be uh, in a season of suffering, of trial. Lord, I pray that you would take these words, Lord, and burn them deep into their hearts and let your words, God, bring comfort. God, if we're not dealing with suffering right now, I pray that you would gather these words into our hearts for a day when we face that, Lord. That your spirit would bring these things to our minds in a timely uh, way. God, I thank you for each woman that's listening. I thank you for her choice to soak in your word. I pray, Lord, that you would take that decision, Lord, and use it to bear precious fruit in her life fruit of knowing you and that the world will see. God, thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen.